Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar um, where we're going to be talking about the results of our vehicle grid mini trial um, completed as part of Electric Nation. So thank you for joining us. Um, this afternoon in the room we have oh, sorry. Uh, this afternoon in the room we have uh, myself, uh, my name is Richard from Innovation Low Carbon Net Engineer uh, for Western Power Distribution uh, and also project manager for the Electric Nation project. Uh, also joining us is Mike Potter, Hi there. CEO from CrowdCharge, uh, Dr Ben Potter, Hello. and Adam Langford. Good afternoon everybody. Um, so just to, a quick run through of what we're going to be uh, looking at for the next hour or so, um, is we're going to sort of give an intro to WPD um, and sort of our Electric Nation project, uh, so what the, what the whole project covered off, and vehicle to grid in the bigger picture. Uh, we're then going to hand over to CrowdCharge um, and they're going to give you a quick run through of who they are um, and what is vehicle to grid. Um, we're going to give you a summary of our vehicle to grid trial, um, so the units that we installed, how we installed them, um, any faults or sort of connection issues we had while we were doing it. And then uh, we're going to go through the trial findings. So we're going to have a look at how the units responded um, to various signals, any monitoring data we got back and any uh, effect on our network that we observed. There will also be a short um, there'll also be a short QA session afterwards. Um, so I believe there's a, a type in box where you can type in your questions and ask them. Um, and we will try to go through as many as we can. Um, if anybody's unable to hear me properly or see the screen, please just let us know in the, the message box um, and we'll try and make some amendments this side. So to jump straight into it then. Who we are. Um, so the Electric Nation project um, was led by Western Power Distribution. We are the electricity distribution network uh, operator for about 7.9 million customers in the southwest, South Wales, East and West Midlands. And our job is to distribute the uh, energy around the UK uh, from 132 kV uh, down to low voltage level. Um, so we also so we're also uh, sort of tasked with connect, connecting with low, new low carbon generation to the network. So solar and wind um, and obviously EVs and vehicle to grid uh, is going to play quite a big part in our network going forwards. So we have four main tasks that we do. Uh, our first job is to keep the lights on, to operate our network uh, assets effectively and to maintain our equipment so that it's reliable and everybody's got power when they need it to fix it. Uh, when there's storms and things get damaged, and to connect customers, um, so connect new generation and sort of domestic and industrial customers, uh, obviously making sure that we've got a suitable network uh, for everybody's needs, and going forward into the future, um, obviously there's uh, a whole new load of low carbon technology being deployed, such as heat pumps and B2G, um, so we're going to be doing a lot of upgrading works and sort of uh, a lot more smart network management. Um, so like I said, we cover four uh, distribution license areas, um, which are the East and West, Midlands, South West and South Wales, uh, about 7.8 million customers. Um, and there's, there's a whole load of uh, substations and overhead lines there that we need to maintain and keep operational. So we have quite an extensive uh, innovation portfolio. So we're always looking forward to the future to see how um, new things in the world are going to affect us and how we can adapt um, to make sure we're going to facilitate this new technology. Um, as you can see there, Electric Nation uh, sits under our transition to a low carbon future. Um, and Electric Nation really came about, uh, it was conceived in 2015. We knew electric vehicles were coming um, and we really need to understand what the impact was going to be uh, for distribution network operators. Obviously, they're, they're, they're consuming a lot of power. Uh, we need to understand how much exactly, when people use it, and, and how people charge it. So we need to really understand that and, and actually how we can defer any potential issues that might arise from, from electric vehicles. So I just want to give you a very, very quick introduction to the Electric Nation project if you're not familiar with it already. Um, it was a huge project uh, a bit of international significance. Um, and what's really important is it takes us from assumptions about EVs through to facts about EVs. At its time, it was the world's largest domestic smart charging trial, 
uh, with 673 participants. <coughs> um, that was involving 40 different makes and models of electric vehicle, everything from plug-in hybrids uh, through to uh, Teslas and full battery electric vehicles. It was a three-year project. It kicked off in 2016. And in fact, we are in the final days of the project now as it wraps up in, on Thursday this week. Um, so we're right at the tail end of it now. And it was uh, conceived, designed and led by EA Technology um, and Drive Electric, uh, obviously looking after the vehicle to grid element of the project. So there was three main work streams that we looked at. Um, I'm going to go slightly out of order on these. The first one was monitoring. Um, so we did a whole load of monitoring on the network to see the impact at low voltage level, see how, how when EVs are charging, uh, we could identify them on the network. We then did uh, our big trial to understand how the 673 domestic customers use their vehicles um, and how, how we need to adapt our, our planning going forwards. We then put that into a modeling tool. So we've developed the network assessment tool off the back of this project. Um, and then if you go into LCNI uh, this week, later on this week, there will, we will run demonstrations of that. Um, and obviously coupled into the mitigation part, we also did a, a very small V2G uh, study to understand how V2G would impact the network and more of a technology trial, um, sort of paving the way for, for bigger projects in the future. So EVs and the distribution networks. Uh, electricity networks were designed before EVs were twinkle and Elon Musk's mind. So our networks are, are, are pretty old. Um, some of them have been around for, for hundreds of years. Um, back in the day, that was enough to power sort of a few lights and a few domestic appliances. Now you've got big loads, uh, particularly with electric heating, and you add EVs onto top of that. On average, uh, we're designed to supply two kilowatts per home. So our network relies on diversity, so people doing things at different times. Um, obviously, having a shower would exceed that 10 kilowatt, um, but you hope that you're not having a shower at the same time as all of your neighbours. So you suddenly add 3.6 kilowatt, 7 kilowatt, depending on the charge on top of this, you've already exceeded that 2 kilowatts per home. If everybody starts doing the same thing at the same time, you can see that stack up, uh, and that's when it starts to give us issues on our network. Um, at the moment, we, we, we've not really seen too many issues because two, three, four, five EVs on a particular piece of network were, were absolutely fine. But we're looking forward into the future when sort of everybody has EVs, or certainly the vast majority of people will have electric vehicles. That's when we can start to see issues arise. So something that we found uh, off the back of our trials with the uh, participants, I'm just going to load up some profiles there. So this is our background um, demand, if you like. So our, our, our typical domestic background load on a, on, on a feeder. You can see here, this is sort of running from midnight to midnight. And you can see overnight, um, there's not much load on the network, uh, not very many people up doing things. And then in the morning, um, about six, seven o'clock, we get our little breakfast uh, peak. So people get up, they start putting lights on, uh, heating, uh, possibly cooking. Um, and then you see it starts to, flat line or level out throughout the day, people are at work, so there's less appliances on within the home. And then we get our tea time peak, um, which is here, so sort of four, five, six o'clock, everybody starts getting in from work, they're turning on the ovens, uh, they're turning on the lighting, heating, things like that. And you can see we, we obviously got less capacity, less headroom, uh, what's going on here. So that's our background loading. If we just look at our winter profile, because people use more energy during the winter, this is the worst case scenario. And we add our EV load to the background. It looks something like that. Okay, so we have our EV load on top. You can see again, there's, there's very little sort of activity going on overnight or cars are starting to finish charging. There's a few plug-in and out vents through, throughout the morning and throughout the day. But in fact, the vast majority of plug-in and start, uh, where people start to charge, is this tea time peak, so about four or five o'clock, and you can see that if we take the results from Electric Nation and add them to our to, to our background load, you can see it exceeds the capacity. And this is this this peak here is the bit that we really need to work with um, to push later in the night, hopefully in this area here, um, to, to keep the network safe. So vehicle to grid could be possibly a, a way to do this. So 
rather than just restricting charges, if people started to discharge their cars uh, during this team time peak, it would raise the green bars just slightly. Um, but, but certainly you could delay it to late in the night. So how can V2G help the network? So V2G en masse has the potential to support the network and improve capacity. Um, in the future, in a future scenario, if uh, the majority of EVs support the grid systems, then this could, could greatly improve the, the network at that peak team time point. If the system drew a little bit apart from everybody's car. Um, the technology could enable peer-to-peer -peer systems in a possibly a future world, uh, which would be a really interesting thing to explore. It enables customers to self-consume with V to H or so vehicle to home. Um, and it could be really uh, effective if, if coupled with solar. Um, so it's basically it's movable storage uh, rather than having to have a dedicated battery pack inside the house. And it's a tool in our future toolkit um, to manage all the demands that will be placed on the network. Um, so it's not the, the, the be or end but it is a tool that we can use to, to support everything and manage the network smartly moving forward. So that's a, a bit of background about sort of the Electric Nation project um, and ha while, we're, while we're looking at V2G. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Mike Potter, who's going to tell you all about CrowCharge and some of the stuff they've been doing with the grid. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to um, look and listen with us today. Uh, so CrowdCharge is uh, a software platform that we developed over the last five years, and it came about because actually with a couple of businesses, the other one's an electric car leasing business, and we identified that getting the energy into the, all the cars that we might want to put on the roads over the next sort of 10 or 15 years would require perhaps a bit of thinking about. And we were involved in a project called Electric, uh, My Electric Avenue with SSE way back in 2012 uh, as a start point in thinking about this. Over those years, we've developed a software platform that enables uh, us to help energy um, partners uh, make use of the flexibility that lies within vehicle charging. Uh, one of the key uh, monitoring uh, outputs from Electric Nation was we were able to study flexibility uh, in terms of the vehicle charging and prove that we could in fact shift that the, the charging from that peak into the evening quite readily. Uh, it's a fact that vehicles on average only need about an hour to an hour and a half of charging every night, but they're plugged in for a much longer period, 10 to 12 hours. So what we do in crowd charge is, firstly, we study the behavior of the people using the cars to understand how much energy they need, when they're gonna plug in, when they need to use the cars. That data enables us to present back to the energy industry the art of the possible in terms of flexibility, energy requirements, how much that can be shifted about. Our energy partners then tell us what they want to do with that. And we take that information and disaggregate then back to individual charging instructions at the vehicle chargers or, or in fact with the vehicles. And as uh, technology moves on, it may be that we have charge points controlling this. It could be that the cars do this uh, independently because they're all becoming connected and they have these, these facilities. We noticed that Tesla, for instance, announced a scheduling part of their onboard system only last week that's rolling out to cars as we speak. So um, a couple of things that we've, uh, we've been involved in, uh, in terms of, how we use that flexibility so far, uh, probably the biggest one that we've tested is managing to a load limit for perhaps a certain bit of network or, or a car park or something like that. And uh, was very successfully, I think, with the Electric Nation project. As part of that also, and separately, we've looked at how we can incorporate time of use tariffs and some dynamic tariffs within uh, the portfolio of services that we can offer. But the main thing that we do is, um, is, is help to understand that, that obviously the behavior of the data, but we also very much along the way have had to get involved with um, 
the engineering work just to make things connect up when there's a lot of different parts to these systems so uh for instance with um the electric nation project we had to make little controllers to go with charge points there weren't charge points that could do what we wanted to do at the time and i think this is something <coughs> that comes along all the time so in integrating vehicle telematics for instance with nissan or, or tesla or whatever all these little engineering problems are also things that need to be overcome to integrate and this project that we undertook um, was very much about that sort of problem really this is about the uh, characterization of the actual charges and how practically do you make them work and, and get them onto the network and, and how does that look can you monitor them effectively can you control them and then hopefully we could, we could see some information from there on um, just uh, worth noting also that we are involved in some projects outside the UK as well. So we have some very small scale trials going on uh, in Japan and Hong Kong, for instance. And it's surprising how universal these problems are to other areas of the world. Of course, other markets have different levels of um, sophistication. The UK market is fairly open and sophisticated in that we've, we've taken the network, uh, low voltage network, and high voltage transmission is separate and the supply is separate and this gives us a slightly different view on the world the the laws of physics don't change around the world though so uh wherever we go we see that lots of evs will mean that the charging needs to be managed so all of this learning in the uk i think is really important and of course when it comes to vtg uk government have put up a substantial amount of funding for uh a number of V2G projects that are in process at the moment. Um, and we thought it was very important with WPD that we start to look at how this impacts the, um, the network operators. And we'll, we'll tell you something about that in a moment. But I think it is worth sharing, and I'll reiterate this at the end. It's our view that visibility is really the key um, to enabling the network operators to uh, sort of manage sorry, manage is not the right word, to not manage actually is the right way of saying this. The more visibility that network operators can get of all this stuff and understanding, the less the inclination to have to manage what's going on. EV charging, I think in um, the uh, Electric Nation project, already WPD have reduced the, um, uh, the after diversity value for a car charge. I can't believe exactly, but I think it's from two and a half to one and a half. So there you go, like just allowing that, that information to get through means that the planners are allowing more charges to go into a given piece of network before they think there's any uh, mitigation that's required. So I just wanted to make that point whilst we're doing this as well. Um, so uh, what is V2G? Um, I think that's a fairly, in, in terms of the, our, 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 um, our software platform, just to give you some idea, when we look at this, really it's just a negative number when it comes to dealing with um, current limits. So our algorithms, you just have to be able to deal with a, a, a negative number. Of course, it's slightly more complicated than that because with smart charging, you get one shot at delivering the energy. So once the car's full, it's full, there's no more uh, energy is required to be delivered, there's no more flexibility that's available. And as we said earlier, as it's only one to one and a half hours worth of energy delivery, it's a fairly small amount of energy. We're talking about seven to 10 kilowatt hours of energy every day on average. So with smart charging, the fun ends pretty quickly with, uh, with um, uh, what you can do there. And with vehicle to grid, of course, you can empty the car out and fill it back up again. So um, you can keep going and there's a lot more uh, ability to influence what's going in the wider energy system. Um, and this is one of the key reasons that when people are talking about the value that, that can come from V2G, it's much higher because you get to cycle the energy around again and again. Um, I think some of the other features about V2G compared to other low carbon technologies that are out there, uh, for instance, we see a lot, there's home batteries. Um, because the cars have 
by comparison, quite enormous batteries, we're now seeing 60, between 50 and 60 kilowatt looks as if it may become the average size of battery for a uh, sorry, kilowatt hour, get my units right. Um, that's becoming the average uh, sort of size for cars that are coming out. Even the lowly uh, Vauxhall Corsa has got a 50 kilowatt hour battery. So you've got a lot of storage compared to um, like wall batteries uh, so far. Also the power output that's available from those limited by the charging equipment really at the moment, but the car's output up to 100, I mean Tesla's like 500 horsepower car. So there's the ability to output lots of lots of power. Uh, we wouldn't want to scare Ricky with that much power. <laughs> at the moment that's limited by the charger, um, even on, on, on three phase through Chadamo protocol to 10 kilowatts. But still 10 kilowatts, right, which is, is, uh, is substantially more. So it's quite a flexible, powerful resource with a lot of capacity. And I think the, um, the attraction for a lot of the people that are involved in this is it's utilising an, an asset that's already been paid for. So uh, you've already paid for a car with this big battery. And really, we're just trying to sweat the asset or share the asset and make more use of it. So it has a, a seemingly a lot of benefits that, um, uh, that make it attractive. So we wanted to look at how this could be used to make sure that it fits in with the low voltage grid or support the low voltage grid. And also it's really important, again, going back to that vis visibility piece, that we understand it so that the connections can be seamless and uh, everybody can understand exactly how that fits together, and get what they want from it. So the objectives was for this trial, really, it was a very small scale. We've got three cars that we put charges into people's homes for. So compared to 700 with uh, Electric Nation, obviously much, much smaller. So we weren't trying to study behavior on that scale. And really, it was for the characterization of the actual equipment and can it work and uh, how does that look? So we wanted to test and prove that we could monitor through the equipment and that we could control it successfully. I think they were the key objectives, really. So we um, we have some profiles, and Ben's going to talk about those in a moment. And we carried out a trial from June through October. Um, and uh, there's a report that will be out in the next few weeks uh, to, to show you all, all the results. We did also, as, a, um, as an ambition as well, want to try and monitor outside of the chargers on the network to see what the effect was. Uh, which Ben's going to talk about. We have varying degrees of success with that, but we are looking to um, extend this uh, the, the investigation to this over with a, a, a project that will be on a much larger scale, uh, and we will be announcing something in the next sort of months over that. So I think I'm ready to hand over to Ben here. Um, Give me one second. Sorry, no, it's me. I need to finish. <laughs> so the uh, the actual chargers that we put in were the um, Nichicon chargers. So uh, I think they were the first mass-produced chargers we put in a home in the UK. Uh, they are six kilowatts units, bidirectional, and they're single phase. In Japan, they've been used extensively as vehicle to home units. They have over 5,000 of these there. Um, obviously in Japan, one of the key functions they're looking for is kind of disaster recovery and backup power, uh, which is why they, they were put in place. Um, they, uh, so this unit's been adapted to provide a vehicle to grid so that it grid ties um, and allows the energy to go back out onto the network. It's, because it uses this CHAdeMO protocol, it only works with certain cars. So in the UK, that's Nissan Leaf, and Outlander PHEV. Uh, we've not seen notice of any other models that may utilize that protocol. Maybe the Honda E, I'm not sure. I haven't actually seen it yet. To check that it's going to use Chadamo, but it is definitely going to come with, um, with bidirectional ability on it. And in the future, we think that um, the other main DC charging uh, protocol, CCS 2025, we hear that that, that may be possible. So 
these units are fairly heavy, 80 kilograms. Uh, so you need two guys to go and to put them in. Um, we also, uh, a bit like with Electric Nation, we've we've had to develop a controller to go with the unit to, that provides the communications and some local smart features um, so that the charger can talk back to the network. The, these chargers use a protocol called EchoNet Lite, which is um, uh, used extensively in Japan. And we uh, uh, we had to learn how to use that and, and turn it into something that we could use the same. So in terms of the installations, as I said, it was three installations. Uh, we found uh, some properties where that could be where they could be put in. We needed to check network maps to make sure that that was suitable as well. And we also then installed some monitoring equipment in one of the sites. We're going to look at the uh, outputs of those. Um, the installation was fairly straightforward, but they are quite bulky units, so. It, it was difficult and some of the sites to find a place to put that. Um, I, think, I think that's what it's us. And lastly, the, um, the actual connection process. So I know that there'll probably be some people on the call who, who have been starting to do this. this uh, the standard for this changed in April this year. So these chargers were connected using the G59 um, uh, application process. That's now been su superseded by G99. Um, it would be interesting to understand more about that. It, it's designed really for much larger um, solar installations that are generating back onto the network. So we found some of the things in there were, you know, a little challenging, but I, th I think we've got through that, and we actually got the charger um, type approved so that it could be connected by G99 as well as G59 in there. Um, but people's experience on utilizing this protocol is very limited, I think. I'm not sure. I'd imagine that for home installations, we're talking about less than 200, definitely probably less than 150 so far. And the communications, as, we, uh, as I said, were using a separate controller. So we're converting EchoNet Lite, which is a very extensively used protocol in Japan. Actually, um, smart meters talk to things in Japan with this um, protocol. And you can go into the equivalent of Curry's and buy a washing machine that talks EchoNet Lite and plug it in and it will work. So uh, I think it's really good to see that that sort of thing is working around the world. Um, the uh, actual controllers, we upgraded compared to what we had with Electric Nation smart chargers. So we included a uh, backup with GSM uh, comms as well. And I'm really happy to report that that was, we had 100% uptime on the communications. We had one go off, but that's because the charger had a fault. Um, uh, so uh, that was a much more robust way of doing things. Uh, and also, I think the learning we had in terms of using Wi-Fi, uh, made that a lot better. And we had one charger fault. So, you know, with such a small sample, I don't think this is uh, conclusive, but we had a higher fault rate with comms and equipment um, in, in Electric Nation generally. So I think it's just maturity of product, really, as it will lead to much lower failure rates in these things in comparison to what we'd seen previously. Uh, so yeah, no, I think that would be our our experience outside of um, this project and Electric Nation with smart chargers that we're putting in now. The comms and the reliability actual chargers is is much more robust. So that, that's all good. So I'm going to hand over to Ben now. Um, right, hello. Um, this is uh, Ben Potter. I probably should point out that I'm not related to, it would, it to would my, be a pleasure, um, it, indeed. <laughs> um, so uh, for the testing in this, we came up with a set of about six um, static profiles that were designed to try and squeeze in as much charging and discharging as we could, but while also making sure that the participants were able then to potentially use their cars if they needed to um, 
a crowd charge would typically often operate with dynamic profiles that kind of respond to things, but in this particular trial, we just stuck with uh, a half a dozen of these uh, static profiles. Oh, seven profiles, that's right. Um, and then this uh, is showing you the charging that happened for uh, one of our participants. So this, this diagram probably is worth a little bit of explanation. So the, it's a heat map. And the, the colours that you see relate to the amount of current that was flowing from about minus 25 to plus 25 amps. So where you see dark blues, uh, that's minus 25. That's a that's a uh, V3G charger that is um, discharging back into the grid. And then when you see the the, the kind of yellow colours, that's that's where the the cars are charging. So going vertically down on the left hand side, that th those are days, and then horizontally you've got 24 hours. So each row going horizontally represents um, one 24 hour period, um, and you can see across uh, the number. How many days was the horizontal again? It's quite a few. Days, yeah. Yeah. Um, so across all of those days, you can then sort of scan across each row and see whether the car was charging or, or discharging. The sort of periods of black. Um, albeit with a very occasional mark, is where uh, the, the, the controller was reporting back into crowd charge, but no, no charging or discharging was taking place and there was no car connected. The kind of quite long periods of, I suppose, that sort of a um, light blue cyan sort of colour, not quite the colours, is when the cars were plugged in, but, but uh, no charging was happening, that's zero amps. And then, as I say, you can see the charging and charging in the, the blues and the yellows. And for example, you can see kind of a trend. If you look sort of vertically on the right hand side of this of this diagram, you can see that typically because of our profiles, we were discharging uh, the, the, the charger sort of in that evening period. So on, on the sort of crowd charge sort of engineering back end portal, we sort of keep track of what's going on with the charge cycles. And uh, again, here on the top, you can see this is current against time current and power actually against time. You can see that the uh, the, 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 the VTG um, car was following the profiles that we were that we were providing pretty much. But there's a few interesting points to draw out of that particular plot. So we were send we were typically sending um, current requests that vary between minus 32 and plus 32, so kind of plus minus seven kilowatts. So because this was a six kilowatt unit, um, unsurprisingly, the charging and discharging typically would cap out at plus or minus six kilowatts, about 25 amps or so. Also, if you kind of just pay attention to um, the, the, the current as you go across these various cycles, you'll see that in some cases it's not at that uh, maximum of six kilowatts. And you know, we found in practice that the actual current that flows does, does depend on a bit of a negotiation between the, uh, the, the the car systems and the charger and depends on the state of charge of the car temperature and that kind of thing so you do see some kind of variation um, we were also tracking the state of charge um, of the uh, of the car which is one of the nice perks of, of most v2g chargers that you get that data coming through on the charger which is nice so we tried to squeeze in a bit of analysis to sort of see whether we could see whether or not these charge and discharge cycles were having much of an impact on the, uh, the, the local network. Uh, so here is a, a little um, a diagram or, or a map showing where the location of the VTG charger was, which is if you follow the, uh, the, the red arrow, kind of in the middle of the, there were two arrows, but the, the location in the middle of the map, that's where the VTG charger was located. And then we had two bits of monitoring kit, one located uh, three doors down, the PM7000 unit. Uh, and then we also had another uh, monitor that was sort of opposite on the other side of the, the road. And we were looking at the voltages in those locations and trying to see whether or not the charge and discharge cycles would, uh, would have an impact on uh, those voltages. So I'll take you back again to this uh, diagram that shows the sort of patterns of charging and discharging. And ideally what we would like to see if, if, if there was a significant impact is if you then plotted the same thing for voltage that you would see some of the kind of same patterns appearing in that voltage profile. 
so uh, as it happened, I mean, so bear in mind, the large lump of black is because we didn't have the, um, the, the, the monitoring happening at that period of time. But if we look at that kind of yellowy area and sort of flick back and forth between this plot and the voltage plot, we aren't seeing um, much of an apparent impact on, on the voltage in this particular location. And then if we sort of have a look at the, the raw data itself, so on the top plot here, we, we're seeing the, uh, the current um, following one of the crowd charge profiles from about minus 25 amps and then stepping up sequentially to plus 25 amps. And on the plot below, we're seeing the, uh, the voltage at the same, same time um, uh, as monitored three, three doors down. And it, it is not immediately obvious or it's very difficult to see or in fact maybe there isn't any clear uh, impact happening on on that voltage and that was a little bit surprising i think given the location on the network but of course it does depend somewhat on the various currents that are flowing in other parts um, of the feeders and at various junctions and things um, we didn't have time uh, as would have been perhaps uh, ideal to do some in-depth modeling of that part of the network but um, some uh, trainee planners from WPD did come in and see us uh, last week and we took the time to put together a, what's the best word, a, a toy model perhaps, um, single phase sort of DC sort of representation of that bit of the network and we sort of put together some resistances based on the real cable lengths and, 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 and uh, parameters and that kind of thing and um, came to the conclusion that probably we should expect with a lot of assumptions to see, you know, maybe a uh, half a volt volt kind of variation happening as a result of that charger. I mean, yeah, those are assumptions. But as I say, um, we weren't really seeing that in the, in, in the data, in data itself. So I think either, you know, the analysis needs to be a bit more in depth. I mean, I've, uh, we looked at some um, uh, correlation factors and things and didn't really see much there. So perhaps it's there in the data or it's very small or that bit of the network is, is, is laid out in such a way that the impact is very small or perhaps maybe the, uh, the phase information wasn't quite right um, for that bit of the network and whereas we thought that the uh, measurement unit was on the same phase as the V2G unit perhaps it wasn't so a learning point there might be to double check that kind of thing. Right I think that's the end of my bit. Yeah all right thanks Ben. So um, in terms of uh, the overall output for for this mini project on electric nation we we feel quite happy that we we set out to do what we want to do test characteristics look at how a v2g charger connects to the network make sure we get some data back from it and uh, so we can monitor and manage as well um, and we we have separately also included it in a batch of chargers uh with with uh, just smart charging so that we can see that we can look at how a group would work so we're quite happy that that's something that can work. Um, in terms of uh, the vehicle usage, it's such a small batch and the vehicle usage patterns were not really typical. Uh, we don't, not sure, yet to be proven, I think, but we're not sure that in, in uh, the world where we all drive electric cars and have a choice between smart chargers and V2G, that people use their cars much, much more differently. It could be that V2G drivers tend to have their cars at home more because they'll get more value out of it, yet to be shown, I, I think, as, as a thing. Um, user acceptability of the charger was fine as a thing to use. It's fine. The actual ones that we're using are quite large. Uh, there, there are, there's a lot of activity in this part of the market, so we're expecting to see different chargers. And already, since we started working with this, there are some new charges that are coming out that, that are much smaller. Um, but the equipment worked pretty much how we expected. Uh, we felt that it's pretty robust. The, we're very pleased with the, the comms performance and uptime and solidity of that it was way better than anything that we'd had before. So, so we thought that was quite good. Um, we'd learned quite a bit about the process of planning to put the charges in. If, if we were doing it for a trial and to investigate around perhaps modelling before we put things in so that we could very quickly see if we um, we know that we've got the kind of results that we want in terms of wiggling the, uh, the voltage. Um, and 
I think overall, we realised that we probably need more inv investigation and a lot more um, uh, a lot more data to be gathered, particularly for V2G for this for this to be a thing. And we do in fact have plans to do that. So uh, overall, we, we were pretty pleased with the output of the project because we have in these sort of projects put in uh, charging equipment that then takes about three months to get it to work how you need it to. And comms have been an issue before, so I think this is very good. I think, for me, I think that's all good. Anything else you guys want to mention at all? Yeah, so uh, th thank you very much, that guys. Um, just uh, if anybody's going to LCNI um, later in the week, uh, they, I'm doing a presentation on sort of the, the findings of the actual trial itself, the, 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 the big sort of, uh, smart charging trial. Uh, so do come along to that, or uh, Mike uh, and myself will be wandering around at LCNI as well on the Western Power Stand. So by all means, if you do have any questions, please do um, come and have a chat to us, and we uh, will have to try some. Um, apart from that. Okay, so we've got a few questions already. So I'll ask that one if you want. Mm. So, so we, we'll pick up on the battery. What is the start point? So uh, battery degradation. I think we've got a question here from Robert Lyle. What impact does V2G have on the battery and its longevity? Uh, I think the real answer is no one knows yet for sure, because um, no matter how much bench testing you do on these things, what real people do with things is is uh, not as easy to forecast. However, what we know so far, there's some work from the University of Warwick that was done that showed that VTG actually could have a, a beneficial effect on, on, on battery uh, or reduction in battery degradation because the worst thing you could do with a battery is fill it up and leave it full. And that's what a lot of people do with their cars. So actually having a V2G uh, charger could help with that, with cars that are not used that often. And just to add, I mean, many of you may be aware of this, but of, but of course, when a car is is driving, uh, the power it's using is often bouncing rapidly, you know, up, up and down between 80, 100 kilowatts and so on and so forth. And whereas a VTG charger at home might be going up and down between six kilowatts or so. So actually driving can, you know, comparatively speaking, could be argued to have a greater impact on the battery. Um, so it's not necessarily <coughs> obvious that a battery being cycled to V2G is going to be going to be worse off. Yep. So uh there's a question here from uh, Mr. Marlowe. How do, uh, does the local grid infrastructure allow for allow for the bidirectional flow of energy for the V2G solution? Um, so yeah, how, how does the grid cope with V2G? I guess at the moment it's sort of on a case by case basis. Um, some parts of the network are absolutely fine. Um, they can more than cope with uh, several V2G units on it. Um, older part of the networks, um, they may possibly be some reinforcement. I mean, we're looking, the, the best answer I'll probably give to this one is we have the network assessment tool, which we're looking to build on. Um, and we're looking to include vehicle to grid in that in a, in a, in a future project, uh, an upcoming project. So we should have sort of a map of where we can connect V2G units with, with, with minimal reinforcement and obviously where ones where we, we need more attention and exactly which bits we need to, to build on. So. Um, yeah, I guess you have to start on Twitter. We can work on that. Um, the next one might be one for me. How do, how do we see VTG working with manufacturers renting batteries? Um, so, our view, um, just with my leasing company hat on, we operate over 3,000 battery cars in the UK, and we see renting, separate renting of batteries, as being so detrimental in the value of the car that we don't think it will be a thing in the future. Um, I, it could change, there may be other models that work, but so far the schemes that have done that have, have resulted in big drops in the value of the vehicles. So um, we don't think that, that that's something that may work. We've also seen people like Neo have a uh, battery swap as, a, as an option. That may be something that works. Um, and then of course the batteries can just be stacked up and used separately from the vehicles as well. But uh, 
it's early days and I think all these business models need to unpack quite a bit before we understand fully. Well, we started, uh, how long did the trial run for? How many days worth of data were collected? Um, I'd have to probably check on the exact numbers, but we started recording data um, from uh, these participants, I think late June, July, I think. And then since, sorry, and then since then, um, you know, a number of weeks, not all weeks, but a number of weeks since then until um, uh, the end of last month, we were, we were capturing data. Okay, so I'm reading this next question. <clears throat> uh, so did we study uh, participant experience with having to plug in all the time? Uh, what was learned, for example, was there any custom scenarios that proved more of an issue in locations where the charger cannot be located right next to the car or I'm afraid I can't be part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think um, that, I think the short answer is we didn't uh, studying participant uh, attitudes to this was not part of this part of the trial. It was very much a technical um, examination of whether the charges work. So um, we are looking forward to extending what we're doing so that we can see the differences between um, smart charging or V1G and B2G and just see, see, see what that does. Will the next study on B2G be public? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you mean open to the public? Is yeah. That, is that, I would take it as that. Yeah, yeah that's so. Yes, that it would be uh, in terms of open to uh, more participants. Yes. Okay. So there were. So there's a question here. Um, how many participants are involved in this BTT trial, and how much does one of the municipal units cost? Um, so there was only actually three involved in this trial because it was just sort of a mini technology trial if you like to see if the, the controllability and um, things like that of the unit. Um, actually we're looking to upscale it uh, in future trials. Um, cost one unit? So for the, the NicheCon units are six or seven thousand pounds at the at present so that's pretty expensive. Uh, it's um, really uh, one of those things where the cost of the technology is starting to already uh, reduce quite quickly. Uh, we saw this with the cars and we saw this with smart chargers, so uh, expect that to change as we go along. Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a question, do you think that future problem around harmonics coming from the discharge this type of equipment has this been observed in Japan? So no, uh, I think the um, EMC standards for all this type of equipment are pretty stringent. The tests that you have to go through uh, mean that most of that is dialed out. Quite a lot of the circuitry in the, um, in the V2G charges is, is dedicated to reducing noise from the rectification. So I think it's a fairly straightforward regulatory question really they get tested they have to be type approved to meet certain emc standards and everyone is very very focused on that when they're putting the charges together so not so far and west western power distribution conducted a trial with um how many cars have we got in the end 20 cars different cars and we tried those with different chargers to, yeah. to test to see if there's any noise on that the, they were smart chargers but the outcome was no, no there was worry about no, nothing to worry about no very little um i can answer the next one will the slides be made available uh yes so we're recording this webinar um should you want to play it back watch it again later um <clears throat> but i can also make the, the the slides available as well um i think we can probably pop them up on our website or uh but we'll just drop one of us an email after this and we can send them out thank you yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Michael Juice has asked about the revenue streams to 360 uh, pounds a year. So these are, we've taken a bit of an average of what we've seen out 
in different projects. Uh, the real answer, Michael, is no one knows yet. Um, but what we can see is there will be a mixture of energy trading, TSO services like frequency response, maybe uh, low, low voltage network uh, schemes such as the one announced by Western Power Distribution and other UK DNOs. So uh, I think it's uncertain as yet, and it was a bit of a, a poll of different projects that we'd seen announced results. Okay, so this is, uh, did you did you try more high resolution charge profiles? The charts look like they were uh, set at uh, half hourly. That's correct, they were. So so for the profiles for this mini trial were, in, in that sense, <coughs> simplistic. I mean, the crowd charge platform working as part of the nation would, would, would sort of work at any time scale um, because, you know, things happen when they happen, cars plug in at, at all kinds of times. And so, you know, we have worked with, um, different kinds of resolutions, but for this trial it was just set at half hour. I'm just going through that. Uh, we've got tons of questions here, so we're just trying to capture it wider. I think we're coming up with some very similar. Um, so we didn't really cover if uh, as part of the project where the cars were charged, they're charged away from home. Um, we've seen that in sort of the state charge in the back of this part. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got one so did you look at the effect on uh, neutral current? So in the analysis we had time to do, no, no, we didn't. As I, I think I mentioned earlier on, I mean, I think really what would have been uh, good to do in this situation is to do a proper um, modeling exercise of, of the actual uh, network um, that one is uh, running the, the trial on to investigate these kinds of things. And I think I would certainly be interested to to look at neutral current um, and look at impact across phases and that kind of thing. Um, but no, that wasn't as part of this this uh, this analysis. Okay. So, what parameters were set and how much the battery could be discharged to the grid? So interesting. One. Yeah. So um, the the cars were just following the um, those, those half hourly profiles that, that charge and discharge. So those profiles were static. They were created manually, um, and were and the car just followed those. So if the car happened to to fill up during a period when it was being asked to charge, it would just stop, and then it would uh, discharge again when it was next asked to um, discharge. But other than following the the, the current profile, um, there were no other limits set on what the battery uh, could do into the grid. We did have one interesting bit of learning though. Uh, one of the sites, I'm going to share this, they're going to tell me in a minute. Uh, <laughs> one of the sites we uh, were restricted to 16 amp charging of the vehicle. And uh, I have to admit that we, we just lost sight of that. So the car was <coughs> able to charge at 16 amps, but discharge at the full 25 amps. So it was emptying out over a, a period. So that was one small oh, yeah, piece of learning, right. wasn't it? Yeah. Just to make sure that you mirrored. Yes. When, when there was a restriction on the network, it needs mirroring to make sure that it's plus and minus. So that was one interesting piece of learning. Yeah. 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 Sounds silly when I say it out loud, but <laughs> it was just one of those things that you learn. Uh, 
there's a question here that says, do you think there could be an issue with different manufacturers using different charging stations and their interaction? Um, I'm not quite sure what the scope of the question is in terms of the interaction, but but certainly I think it is likely that different chargers and different you know, car manufacturers are all going to behave a little bit differently, um, especially as one starts to perhaps look at response rate and things like that. So so yeah, I think that's an area to keep to keep an eye on. Ah, okay. So I think um, that, that we've got absolutely tons of questions there, but I think we've tried to capture off as as, as many as we can. Um, what I will do though is I will get like a, a printout and I will sort of. Um, answer all the questions, put them up on the website, um, or reply directly to, to, to some of the more technical ones that people have asked there, so we'll get you an answer. Um, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, no, thank you. Yes, no, thank, you. Like thank, thank you. Yeah, that's excellent response. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see some of you at OCNI. So thank you all. We're going to sign off now.